Good morning. Are we happy today? <laughs> we are happy today. That's why we are singing. We are happy today. That's why we are praying. And that's why we are living. God is good. All the time. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, last week, uh, we talked about uh, not all brokenness can lead to a tragic end, right? And uh, even how ugly it seems, our brokenness is, um, we can find beauty um, in our brokenness. And we also learn how our brokenness can lead us to blessedness. If we follow God and if we allow God to shape us and work in us and work through us. And as we all live in this fallen world, brokenness is, um, I would say, very much part of our existence. And God knows that life is not all fun and laughter. Well, in fact, in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible said, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And a time to mourn and a time to dance. So there's a time under heaven. And uh, again, the Bible said there's a time also for us to, to weep, to cry, to mourn, and to grieve. And as we go through this life, um, we experience different levels of pain and hopelessness. And again, some are heavier than the others. And even your joy, even our joys, each of us at different level of joys. And, um, you know, the more personal we are attached to someone, say a person who died, the more painful and heartbroken we are, right? So it depends on, again, it has different level. And sometimes our brokenness is brought about by other people's brokenness. Okay, do you agree? For example, your, your best friend's mom or your best friend's dad died. Now, because you are so attached to one another, let's say like you're a brother to each other, you will be broken. You will feel the hurt and almost have the same level of brokenness with that of your best friend, right? And sometimes... Uh, other people's brokenness in their sins or of their sins will break us, you know, especially those that are really close to us. Um, I saw this movie uh, many, many years back about three close friends. They grew up together. They're like brothers, you know, and one grew up to be a police officer. Then the other one grew up to be a uh, drug addict. And the other one grew up to be a gang leader. Then, uh, as years passed by, this police officer, he was heartbroken because he saw his two friends, their life was wasting away. He was so heartbroken because he's an officer of the law. And he sees these two best buddies of him their life going down the drain. He cannot eat, he cannot think properly because of what's happening with his three best buddies. Now, come to think of it, it's not his sin. But because of how close he was to these friends of his, he was heartbroken. But if other people's sin can break us so much, could hurt us so much, how much more painful and broken we are over our own sin. Right? Now this morning, we will continue on with our part two of our brokenness lesson. Um, if anybody was not here last week, I can repeat the lesson this morning. <laughs> so this morning, the, uh, the lesson would be Brokenness over sin. Now, 
quite interestingly, my dear brothers and sisters, that when Jesus went up on the mountainside and began to teach about this famous Beatitudes, or what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus started off with these two blessedness, our scripture reading. Again, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, as was read a while ago by our brother Tony, it says there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, as we progress in our lesson this morning, we will get back to these scriptures and see how they relate in our topic at hand. Now, let's leave it for a while. Now, oftentimes, our position in life, whether it be in, in the society, whether it be in the workplace, or even in the church, that position somehow, you know, uh, many people have elevated themselves with this word pride, okay, because of their position. And when we have developed this pride in us, the word entitlement, or the word entitled goes along with the pride, right? Now, it, it is like that our position gives us that special pass or gives us that special privilege that you must be treated in a more special way than the others and that you can do whatever you want to do because you have that position and probably thinking in yourself that you are so much entitled, okay? Now, just like King David in 2 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 12, 7 and 8. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Now first, let's see the tone of the voice of God. The tone of the voice of God here was a tone of disappointment. A tone of disappointment to David because David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then David had her husband, Uriah, killed in the battlefield in the process. Now, God told David that he had given him the crown, right? I made you king, God said. And God gave David a kingdom to rule. He made David powerful, rich, and famous. And God even told David, and if all this had been little, I would have given you even more. You know, David just need to ask God and it will be delivered to him. But no. Okay. We all know that David, from a ship taker or ship keeper, he became king. He became well known. And pride went into his heart, went into his entire being. And his kingship gave him that sense of entitlement, of doing anything that he wanted to do. Even taking someone else's wife at his wishes, of course. And just like David, he felt like, I am the king, right? I am the king, I can do anything. I made the rules so I can break the rules. Right? So pride went into him and the sense of entitlement went in with pride because he is the king. And when God saw what David did, God sent prophet Nathan to confront David and said words to David. Now, God revealed to David his sins to the prophet or to prophet Nathan. And God was so furious at David. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, 9 and 10, God said through prophet David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart 
from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. You see, these were the sins of King David. He took Bathsheba to be his wife, he committed adultery, and killed Uriah, committed murder. Now, but here's the thing. Now, many of us probably know that David had Uriah, you know, put at the forefront of the battlefield to be really killed so that David could have Bathsheba to be his wife, right? And that's the story. Well, actually, that's just not quite the real truth and the whole truth. That's just part of the truth. If we're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 11, we can see the whole truth behind why David had Uriah killed. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David did not actually think of killing Uriah in the first place. When David took Bathsheba and lay down with her, and when Bathsheba went home, after a few days, Bathsheba learned that she's pregnant. She found out that she's pregnant. And probably being rattled, David thought of something to, to, to hide, to cover up. In the first place, David, again, did not think of killing Uriah. So what he had in mind, he called Joab, his commander, and uh, he, he summoned, he asked Joab to, to bring Uriah to him. And when Uriah came, David told Uriah, oh, you've been so, so many days out in the battlefield, you deserve a rest, you go home. Take your needed rest, go home, lie down with your wife. Enjoy your family, enjoy your wife, go home. You deserve it. Now, why is that? Because David wanted really for Uriah to go home, to lie down with his wife, so that after learning that Uriah, uh, that uh, Bathsheba is pregnant, it will be with Uriah, right? So, okay, Uriah said, okay, I'll go home. Now, what happened was, 2 Samuel 11, 11, Uriah said to David, the ark and the Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open, in the open country. How could I go to my house? How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as, I, as, surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. So Uriah, he did not go home. He stayed with his commander Joab and with the troops. So when morning comes, David learned that Uriah didn't go home. He was disappointed. And he again called Uriah. Why did you not go home? I told you to go home. I will not. I cannot leave the troops. You know. And then David said, okay, you could stay for another day. You stay for another day, and tomorrow you go home. You go home, go to your lovely wife. And then the following, then that night, they got drunk. Then again, Uriah did not go home. <clears throat> he stayed. So David was like, this guy is stubborn. He's not going home. Now the plan. Since you are not going home, since this guy is not going home, I will have you killed. So he called Joab. He told Joab, you put this guy at the forefront of the battle where the battle is the fiercest, and then you move back so that he will be killed. And that's what exactly what happened. So again, in the first place, David did not think of killing Uriah. But because of what happened, now the thought of killing him began sinking into David. Okay. <clears throat> One lesson is that a sin cannot be corrected by another sin. A sin cannot be corrected by another sin. 
it will be it will be foolish for us to even think that another sin can correct another sin. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible said, All unrighteousness is sin. Sin is a sin. We cannot make an excuse and defend our sin. And Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So probably David thought that committing another sin would correct his sin with Bathsheba, but no. No one can escape the eyes of God. David thought, and probably many people today thought that they could escape the eyes of God by trying to cover up their sins. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27, after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Nobody can cover up their sin and get away with it. David thought that he could cover up his sins and he could get away with it. But God knew everything. That's why God said he was displeased with what David had done. In a scripture reading, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, question, what does the poor in the spirit mean in this verse? And what is the relation of this to David's sin? Now, poor in the spirit does not mean that you are financially broke. No, it's not. And it does not also mean that you have to give out your wealth or that you give out your fortune and live in poverty. It's not. Okay. Now, can you imagine with me for a while? Okay. Just for a while. Imagine with me. <clears throat> Picture yourself as being a destitute. Okay. In the real sense of the world. The real sense of the world. You're poorest of the poor. You are so poor. As we call it in, in our language, um, mahirap pa sa daga. Daga is rat. Okay? Poorer than the rat. Okay? So you are destitute. Poorest of the poor. Now imagine yourself being destitute. Okay? And then your last recourse is you know, last recourse to survive is to beg for money, to beg for food, panhandling. Okay? And you do that to survive, right? Now, your survival is totally <clears throat> dependent on the handouts of the people passing by, correct? Okay. For without it, <clears throat> you will die of starvation. You will die of, hung of hunger. Okay? Now, this is what is meant by being poor financially. Okay? Being poor financially, <clears throat> meaning your life is totally dependent on other people's means to survive. Okay? Because you have no means to survive. Now, poor in the spirit, by principle, it is the same. Being poor in the spirit means recognizing and admitting we are spiritually bankrupt and cannot survive without God. We are totally dependent on God for life. We thirst for God. We hunger for God. That's what is meant by Jesus when he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Now, to further understand, let us look at another translation. In the New Living Translation of the Bible of Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says, God blesses those who are poor. And what does it mean? And realize their need for Him. Being poor means that you need God. You are poor in spirit, 
because you are spiritually bankrupt. Because you must live with total or in total dependency for God. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, the question is, what is the relationship of this to David? Okay. Did David ever felt guilty? Did he ever feel guilty of his sins? Of course. Definitely. Before Nathan confronted him, David recalled his guilt in Psalm chapter 32. That is why David came to his senses of confessing his sins to God when he said, Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Now David recognizes his spiritual bankruptcy. He knew that if he continued to hide his sins to God, and he will definitely die spiritually. If he continue to hide what he did, he knew that he would die. And nobody can sustain him. Nobody can sustain David and for, for him to go on living except God and only God alone. He acknowledges that his life must be totally dependent on God. Now in the preceding verses of Psalm 32, David recounts that he is wasting away. His life is wasting away. He is dying spiritually because God is not with him. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. And I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated. My strength dried up like water in the summer heat. You see, David recognizes because of his sin that he became poor in his spirit. That he needed the Lord in his hand because he is dying spiritually. His life is wasting away because of what he did. And that's what is meant by being poor in spirit. We recognize that we must live in total dependency on God. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now the mourning or the weeping in this particular verse does not only refer to it, there's someone or something tragic happened to you, to us, to your loved ones, or when we lost someone. That's not the meaning. That's not the only meaning of this, uh, this verse. There is far more deeper meaning to this verse than mourning over the loss or over a tragic incident. No. Now, of course, let us try to, let us see, and we have seen from the pages of the Bible that God cares for you so much. If you browse the Bible, it is spilled all over in the Bible that God cares for you and that God, uh, he will comfort us when we are strike with tragedy. Now, what good, uh, one good thing about tragedy is that it brings our stubbornness okay, to our, you know, to, to kneel down before the Lord. It makes us realize and see that we need God. And God is always, definitely, always right. There's a purpose for everything. There's a purpose for everything, even in your sorrow, even in my sorrow. There is purpose for it. And he will not let the pain go away without teaching you or teaching us a lesson or two. And by his mercies, we just hope that we will learn from all of our mourning, from all of our sorrows and all of our experiences. Now, the word mourn in this verse, it means to lament, to mourn, to feel guilt from the Greek word penthontes. Okay? To mourn, to lament, or feel guilt. Now, what caught my attention was the word feel 
guilt or be guilty. Okay? Somehow, you know, at first glance, somehow it feels like the word, the word feel guilt doesn't sound right and does not fit to those words lament or mourn. Right? Now, for example, if someone close to me that died, should I feel guilty? Should I feel guilty? Why is the word feel guilt is there? Should I feel guilty? Of course, I mourn. I mourn. You mourn. We cry, of course. But to feel guilty, why? I have nothing to do with whatever tragic experience you have. But the word said to feel guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of what? Now, if we're going to think deeper, okay, there's something more to it. Right? Now, one Bible translation somehow made it clear using the Amplified Bible, uh, Bible translation. Blessed are those who mourn over their sins and repent. For they will be comforted. So there it is. So the word mourn does not only refer to if someone you know, dies or we lost someone or, or there's a tragic uh, experience. No. To mourn or, or to weep in this particular verse when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, it is in reference to your sins. It is in reference to my sins. That we must feel guilty of our sins. When Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, Jesus was talking about their sins. Jesus is talking about my sins. That there must be remorse in our sins. It's okay. It is part of our emotions to mourn over the loss of someone. But Jesus was telling the people when he uh, teach the Sermon of the Mount, uh, at the Sermon of the Mount, when he said, blessed are those who mourn, he was referring to their sins. That they must have this remorse in their sins. That we must mourn over our sins. Because if not, we will be eternally condemned. Not only we must weep because of the loss of our uh, beloved someone. The most important thing is we must be mindful of our sins and mourn over it. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to feel guilty about our sins. Now, David mourns over his sins. In Psalm chapter 51, we see a very uh, repentant David who mourns over his sins and longs for God's forgiveness. In Psalm 51, 1 to 4, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You see, brothers and sisters, when David mourns over his sins, David, oh God, comforted him by having his sins forgiven. And this is what Jesus was exactly, uh, what, what he was telling the listeners when he said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who see. Blessed are those who are mindful of the way they live. Mindful of their sins and mourn. Be remorseful of their sins. And David did exactly that. He mourned over his sins. That's why Psalm 32 verse 1, David said, If you confess your sin, David said, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Because he knew when he confessed of his sins, he knew that God forgave him. That is why in this verse, he said, Blessed is the one. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven. 
See, when David sinned against God, you know, he was dying inside. He was dying inside. The guilt of David was so much that he felt God was so distant from him. And he felt God and thought that God had abandoned him. There was no joy in him. There was no joy. He was wasting away. Okay. That's why in Psalm 51 verse 12, David said, Give me back the joy of your salvation. Restore to me, O Lord, the joy of my salvation. Because he was wasting away. Because he thought and he felt that God was so distant from him. There's no joy in his life. That's why he prayed to God, Lord, give me back the joy of your salvation. You know, David lost that once wonderful fellowship with God. Now, when he uttered this, he is asking God for mercy so he would once again enjoy that wonderful fellowship with God. You know, he was begging God to come to him again. To come to him again into fellowship with him. That is why, you know, the way, I mean, the way it was. Because the way it was, something personal. He was intimate. God and David, they walked together. And David, and that is why he was called man after God's own heart. And David wanted that to, to, to go back, to, to return, to be that person, to be that man after God's own heart again. That's why he prayed this to God. Give me back the joy of your salvation. He want the kind of relationship that once he and God had. They walked together. Something that is intimate. He lost that fellowship when he sinned against God. Now, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, in our brokenness over our sins, you know, if we ever think there's no way out, and we think that we are trapped in a cage and that we are shackled in the slavery of sins, I want all of us to look at David. I want everybody to look at David once again. A man after God's own heart. He lost that fellowship with God. But when he uh, repented his sins to God, when he opened up his heart to God again, he had again this wonderful, ship, a wonderful fellowship back with God. David, who once uh, in his life fell into the deep, or fell too deep into that fox holes because of his sins. But God was so good all the time. He rescued David, and David chose to be unbroken. And David chose to be a blessed person again. Now, just like David, there will be a time that we need to admit our spiritual bankruptcy. That we need to, come, we need to approach God and come clean to God. That we are poor in spirit and that we are totally dependent on God. And at the end, you know, the interest, the interest, the yield of our investment in total dependency of God will be ours is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. If we are totally deem that we are poor in spirit, if we totally deem that we need God, then at the end of our commitment to God, ours is the kingdom of heaven. Just like David, God wants us to be mindful of our way of life. Not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. God wants us to be mindful of our sins. God wants us to mourn over our sins, feel guilty of our sins, to be remorseful of our sins and turn away from it. God wants us to feel the emptiness and longingness of His presence and fellowship. 
And when this happens, being tired and exhausted, you know, because of mourning, because of weeping, and after that, look what's waiting for us. We will be comforted. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Brothers, sisters, and friends, remember that it is our choice. It is your choice. Either you remain broken or see God. Either you, you remain hopeless or you see the blessedness in your brokenness. You don't have to remain in the pit, in the mud. You don't have to remain in your sins. God can heal you. You just need to open up to God. You, need, you don't need to be broken all your life and die with your sins. Just like David, pray, pray that you will have, that God will restore that joy, that fellowship with you. And by God's mercy and grace, I know that he will. And you will have that fellowship with him once again, just like David, a man after God's own heart. And you will be happy and you will be joyful. If you are still living in your sins today and have not properly accepted Jesus, may I, may I encourage all of you to think about your spiritual life carefully. You might think that you are really happy or really satisfied. Let me leave all of us with this final verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are rich and miserable and poor and blind and naked. My dear brothers, sisters, and friends, and for those who have not yet accepted the Lord, you don't have to be rich all your life. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to be blind and naked all your life. You can be happy and you can be joyful with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven someday. God bless all of you. And the, the gospel is yours. Shall I ask the congregation to stand up as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning.